I hate calling like the the far left folks liberals because it's it's such a, an abomination or aberration of the term because that's not liberal. Yeah. At all. Hello and welcome to Unsafe Space with Carrie Smith and my co-host Carter Laren. Hello, Carter. How are you? I'm well. How you doing, Carrie? I'm good. I'm I'm uh, getting some practice in reading the bios. I'm actually I'm really excited because today's guest is a friend of mine. I can call you a friend, although we haven't met in person, but we've done we've met online a few times and I've been on your show. Uh, we're today we're speaking to Greg Wilson, who's one of the hosts of the Three Crater Symposium. He is an Air Force veteran. He's a cybersecurity professional with both a BS and an MBA in information security. And he has an affinity for my dog, Tiger, who is wearing a special hat today just for Greg. <laughs> oh, God, I'm sick. <laughs> <laughs> that was a good I, you know, I, I, I called around to all the uh, Chinese restaurants in Texas and none of them would take him. <laughs> How no. dare you, sir? <laughs> <laughs> just so people just so people understand, it's a joke because everybody that posts pictures of their pets, the response is always back like, Oh, it's so cute. So I just wanted to be the, the one jerk that goes gross. <laughs> and it just kind of evolved from there. So now it is expected that I insult Tiger. Yes. And I you know, I've got a reputation to live up to. You have to live up to it, and I have to say, it, it you tickle my funny bone. It's exactly my kind of humor. It makes me laugh every time. I don't care if it's the same joke every time in a different way. <laughs> it's like Little Britain. They always did the same joke, but in a different way, you know? So, uh, but what's funny to me is when new people start following me, and they don't know the... They don't know that you do this, and they get mad at you. <laughs> yeah, I like to see the angry faces. I'm like, oh, they have no idea. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, should I tell them? Mm, no. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you for the laughter. Well, thank you, Greg, for joining us. I was really excited for you and Carter to meet, because um, I think you're going to have a lot in common, maybe. I also um, think Tiger is ugly. But I know to call hey. animal control, oh, we're, 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 not Chinese restaurants, because animal control will actually harass you. <laughs> animal control. Yeah, that's what you do. Um, well, we're off to a good start, so so much in common already. Excellent. So why don't you tell us a little bit about, um, wh why don't we start, before we get into your background, which you have led a really interesting life, um, why don't we start with... What is Three Crater Symposium? When did you guys start it? And how did what what was the purpose behind it? What made you com feel compelled to start a show? Well, uh, God, it was probably about three years ago or so. Um, and so I've always been pretty political over the past decade or so. I've gotten more so. And you know, with the, the the attacks on freedom of speech has just gotten completely out of control. I, the majority of my friends are Democrats or, you know, libertarian, liberal leaning. And it started bothering me because the stuff that's happening was an insult to them because it kind of gets, you know, they're Democrats. So therefore they get pegged for a lot of this stuff when I was like that. That's not who they are. That's how, how they've ever been. And so I was really getting fed up with it. And so kind of started getting more into it, more vocal with friends and family. And my father had actually gone and on a National Review cruise years National back. National Review? National Review okay. cruise. <laughs> uh, he's a big National Review fan. Um, I didn't even know they do cruises. Is it like the new yeah. kids on the block cruise, but you pay extra sure. money to get to hang out with the editor who writes for National Review? I forget. Um, <laughs> back then, it was uh, ah, there's a whole bunch of them, and their that names might have are been in the days of PJ O'Rourke. Like you could do like drugs with with National Review people, right? That was like 
Didn't fun people used to write for the National Review back in the day? No, am I crazy? Yeah, well, back in the day. Um, yeah. Uh, they've they're still good writers, and I enjoy that they have different perspectives. But they have definitely gone downhill and started getting a little, you know, orange man bad. Which, hey, if you don't like Trump, that's totally cool. Plenty to criticize him on. But there's there's a delineation between legitimate criticism of Trump and criticizing just because orange man bad. And I've definitely started seeing that. But that's neither here nor there. So Natural Review Cruise, my father met uh, Professor Rachel Fulton Brown on this cruise. And he was telling me how what all the stuff that she was dealing with and being under attack um, at the University of Chicago and by her former students and, you know, all the English department bullies online and trying to get her canceled. Um, So I got invited into a group, a private group with her, basically, that was designed around, you know, defending academics and a lot of it was defending her and have, giving her some backup of, you know, when, when she was constantly under attack. So, uh, from there, um, we all started doing meetups mm-hmm. and that was actually started by uh, Josh Arguin, who is a co-host of mine. He's a panelist. Uh, he hasn't been on for a little bit cause he's been so busy with work, but he was like, Hey, we should all have like do a Google meetup. And we did that a few times and just talking to everybody, you know, everybody's got these different experiences, different knowledge base, you know, their teachers, historians, lawyers, all sorts of uh, various fields of expertise. And so I was like, man, I mean, we got so many different minds and you guys are so smart and it's just so cool listening to the different perspectives. It's like, this is kind of something that I don't really see that often online i was like we should do a podcast so we originally you know we started out did several recordings that will never be aired (laughs) because they (laughs) they were god awful and then uh you know we started not doing live now we do exclusively live shows um but at the time we weren't going live and you can go back and see a lot of our first episodes at three creators symposium and it's uh they're pretty awful but we got (laughs) Um, so three craters, craters with a K, uh, it's based off of the ancient Greek symposiums, the idea that they would discuss the important items or topics of the day over wine, essentially. And the crater is actually the mixing vessel. So that was what they would pour all their drinks out of is the crater and they would mix water and wine and there's you know how much water do you mix to wine what kind of uh what kind of symposium do you want to have and then there is a uh, a play about dionysus and in that play they talk about the uh the various levels of drinking at these symposiums and so three craters is when all the wise men go home and after that you know after three craters You're stuff done. Kind of, uh, it's a little crazy so that's that's where the whole thing came from and you know our abbreviation is 3ks and so we've gotten you know from a lot of the the uh far left progressives are like oh 3ks huh ku klux klan oh my gosh like well if you guys would google crater for like 10 seconds you would find out that that's wrong but yeah you can you can go that route if you want wow (laughs) I wouldn't have even made that connection. They're really, that's crazy. Um, Well, Carter, yeah, your uh, your slogan is behind Carter today on his little magic board. I see that, yes, and Vino Veritas. The the toast that we always forget to do now, um, but we toast at the beginning in Vino Veritas in Wine Truth. Um, Mm -hmm. So thank you for uh, having that up there. And that's, that's kind of a big thing is, you know, I was looking at this back in the day, you know, you could have discussions be around a dinner table. You guys would be drinking. You could discuss politics. You could even argue and be yelling at each other. But at the end of the day, you know, there's room in the couch if you need help. 
you know, you still help your neighbor and stuff. And we've gotten just so far past that. And, and you guys really do that. That I've been on your channel a couple of times and it was a lot of fun because it just felt like you definitely disagree with one another and you have people on who, who um, challenge you, but, but there's this, just this sense of just spirited debate or conversation. And I don't know what's that word collegial maybe, or just friendly, which I really enjoyed. That might be the right word. Collegial. Maybe. Collegial. Um, yeah, that's why I, it's just, it's laid back. It has fun. Uh, we have fun with it. We goof off a little bit or a, a lot really, but, <laughs> um, <laughs> But yeah, I just, and we always invite people that disagree with us. We we want to hear other voices, and we are firm believers in uh, the First Amendment, and we're absolutists on that. So even when you, unless it's something just completely egregious, we don't delete comments. We try to get to the comments, and we especially try to get to the comments when people disagree with us, so we can actually engage civilly and have a uh, an actual discussion instead of a. Uh, Everybody that I disagree with is a is a Hitler. So, right. Do you have a lot of? Uh, do you get a lot of people from the radical social justice left wanting to engage with you? Um, because to do no. to show up on your show, you have to at least agree that dialogue is valuable in some way. Um, we've definitely tried, um, but we just I just haven't had that much viewership from them. Um, and not really had much engagement uh, from the far left, really, at all, or the social justice side. Um, they don't typically. This is this is interesting. You say this because it's just it's not a bug. It's a feature of the social justice left. Is that they don't. You know this. You both know this. But they don't engage with people who disagree. They actively teach people not to. Um, engage because they view the whole world through this lens of power, this struggle for power. And if you have a different opinion, if you disagree with the ideology, the excuse they give their little cult members is to to avoid discussion is that there's a power imbalance in the com and the conversation itself cannot happen without an imbalance of power. Oh, yeah, so, you're absolutely right, and it's 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 really it's really sad to see because I've seen people I've known since elementary school that have fallen into this. And like, I knew they were good people. I know they're still good people, yeah. but they're so like the ideology has enslaved them so much. Yes. And I mean, nobody's completely objective for somebody to say, Oh, I'm completely neutral. I'm completely objective. That that's naive. That's a total lie. Um, no matter how much you want to believe it. And, you know, and that's why we always try to push like, hey, you know, we're coming from a more classically liberal conservative perspective. And we try to present both sides as best we can during an argument or something. But look, it's it's not going to be objective, um, truly. Right. And, but at least but, you're willing to have the conversation. I think that's really that's a that's a feature of classic liberalism, which is to it's the idea that other viewpoints, other ideas make can make your idea stronger. Or yeah, and that's why I kind of I hate calling like the the far left folks liberals because it's it's such a, an abomination or aberration of the term because that's not liberal. Yeah. At all. <laughs> I mean, like I you... consider myself liberal, but in a class, I have to preface it with the classical liberal because the term has taken such a different meaning now. Yeah. And, and you're, you're right that these is especially like the SJW left is soon as what I like to do is I like to try to break their logic down. So I like to step by step, ask them questions like let's follow your line of logic. So what does this mean? Like, for example, I have major issues with the BLM movement because I love all races and I hate racism with a passion. And to me, this is nothing to do with black lives, especially when they're going out there saying part of white supremacy is manners and 
being well spoken, communication skills, math, uh, yeah. individualism, hard work. And I'm like, what? Let's break this down logically. What are you trying to say about black people? Because when I look at somebody, I don't look at their color or their skin. I look at them and I, I judge them based on what they actually do, how they speak. I base them on how what their actions are. I base them on their work. And so the content of their character, not the color of their skin. And I'm not seeing that at all. I mean, everything is identity politics. Mm -hmm. And I, when I try to break that logic down, basically, I'm the, it's usually I get blocked instantly or, you know, I'll get called whatever name in the book. And, and then they'll bring their friends in to all, you know, think that that's going to, you know, if we have 17 people calling you a Nazi, then you're definitely a Nazi, you know, and then eventually they'll, delete the post or whatever and they'll disappear block me I and mean, that there's never any real engagement yeah right well you seem like to me just my perception of you, you seem like a person who doesn't who, who's not um who doesn't avoid conflict would that would you say that that's true maybe you don't have any uh, conflict aversion or or did you oh, no. like me did you have to go through a period of getting past fear to start speaking um that's a good question. I I have to kind of control myself at times because I do like conflict and that's not necessarily a good thing. And mm -hmm. so I, I I will have to tone myself back and sometimes avoid situations because I know my own personality. Because so I always try as best I can to stay calm because I used to have major, major anger issues. I used to be like a complete jerk to a lot of people. And pretty ashamed of it. And I don't want to get back into that route. And I see that in a lot of these people. So sometimes I'm not a, I'm not afraid of the conflict because I tried to engage to hopefully maybe, you know, plant a little seed in them uh, that maybe they'll start to change and start questioning their own ideology and not, you know, being so hateful. Because, like, all I see is, it's just so much hate and that just tears you up. I used to be full of hate and it completely destroyed me. I mean, I was depressed. I was suicidal. I hated everybody. I was not a happy person, you know, since getting rid of all that, like I've been very successful, you know, I'm out here. I just bought my wife a brand new Jeep. That's what I'm sitting in, you know, cause I've been successful enough to be able to do that for my wife. I'm out at a beach house right now, actually, because we're getting ready for a wedding tomorrow. So there, everybody behind me is all getting, you know, ready for this wedding <laughs> and everything. Um, so, like, life is good. I'm super happy. You know, I got a wife and kid. You know, life's life's great. You know, why why would you want to? Why would you want to ruin that? Like, there's like people are incredible. I hate the identity politics because people are amazing. Look at the stuff that people come up with. You know, you go to Pinterest and see the different ideas that people have. And it's like, who thinks of this? That's incredible. Like this genius stuff. I'm like, if you don't ex uh, try to push individualism, you're, get, you're just destroying the capabilities of man. And that it's like there's there's no limit to it. Yeah. yeah. What you're saying just deeply resonates with me because... How long ago was that that you would say you started coming out of that anger? Oh, probably I started really working on it probably about 10 years, 10 years, 10, ago. years ago. Um, and over the past, I would say eight years is when I really like started seeing a difference to really working on it. Cause like once you, there's like a plateau and once you kind of get over this little hump, mm -hmm. um, you start realizing, like, what the hell was I doing? And it's it becomes easier, and it actually becomes harder to go back. And it's interesting because you, you start seeing situations that would set you off before, and then you can start realizing how irrational it was in the first place. And you can better relate to other people to say, hey, man, you know, that's not worth it. You know, let's, let's try to calm down. Now... I'll be, a, I am a snarky guy and I do like to start <laughs> shit. Um, and it's not necessarily all good, you know, um, but I do, I do like messing with people. <laughs> I, 
I feel well, trained. a bit of I think a bit of that Greg, is necessary. That's what we call the virtuous trolling. A bit of the snark, a bit of the trolling is good, I think, because it's it, the best trolling is when you're getting people, other people, to reveal some truth about themselves. You're revealing yeah. truth by baiting them, and that that has its uses. It doesn't mean that I think it needs to be um, the tool for every job, <laughs> but I yeah, I appreciate it's people who can one weapon in the. Uh... <laughs> in the armory you know not the not it shouldn't be really the necessarily like this is my main weapon kind of thing but yeah i mean i've been doing a lot of like political posters and stuff because i like to de-stress by messing around with photoshop so i've been making photoshops based off of classic movie posters and uh um the first one is actually not even well it was the one i did of tiger based off the go one and I was like, I, I just got a kick out of it, and I had fun. So I was like, I'm going to start doing this. And so I liked it because I've I've ticked a few people off with it, and it is revealing of like what what they get upset about. Yeah, I I just yeah. started. Yeah, I had there's two Biden ones. One is like the uh, based on the Eyedwise Shut poster. Where it's the, the purple background of the picture frame and it's uh, Nicole Kidman, Tom Cruise, but instead I called it uh, uh, Nose Wide Open. Oh, and yes! <laughs> sniffing somebody's hair. <laughs> and then I did uh, a play on the uh, Natural Born Killers where I did Biden with the, the glasses and it's a uh, Natural Born Groper. Natural Born Groper, yes. <laughs> And uh, that one really set an old friend of mine off, like, big time, uh, <laughs> which I – there's a point, like, I like messing with them, but then there's a point you know, like, this is not healthy. Like, I just, just stop because they're not going to stop. And it's, yeah. like, it's clearly bothering them, like, to a point where, like, they're clearly going way beyond just irrational. So there's times where, like, all right, let's just end this, you know, and – but – yeah, that one, that, that one got a little crazy. She she got a little too upset, and I probably egged it on a little too much. But uh, done that one, and then the most recent one I did, based on the um, anatomy of a murder, the old uh, poster, and I did anatomy of a tweet. And so instead of the 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 body chopped up into pieces, it's the it's the Twitter bird chopped up in pieces. Um, I love it. <laughs> Well, why don't you tell me a little bit about since you um, since you started doing the show, and maybe you haven't experienced this, but have you faced any kind of backlash or repercussions? We have a lot of people who watch who in the comments and in the chat have been telling us, hey, they're just starting to get past some of their fear and are finding ways to speak up in their own way. Maybe it's going to their kids, um, the school council meeting, Maybe it's pushing back um, in that way, or maybe it's just having conversations conversations with friends and family. Have you experienced any negative consequences of doing the kind of show that you do and of speaking what you believe to be truth? And and then I guess would you balance that out with what are the positive consequences or the positive uh, results? Negative um, from regular viewers and stuff not really i mean we'll get some of the uh angry comments and stuff what about um, for your career you have a job like does, does it affect oh, your well, job like my, people are afraid to speak out I, yeah i'm in a job like i don't advertise where i work or but it's it's kind of hard to figure out like yeah you know i work in cybersecurity, but that's about it um and if people wanted to call like it's such a huge company if they called and they're like, Greg Wilson said, blah, 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 you know, I'm offended. They would be like, who? <laughs> <You know? laughs> uh, and so I'm not really concerned. I mean, there are certain things I don't go in just, you know, you do have to have a certain level of self-censoring. And that does bother me that even I find myself kind of self-censoring at times. Um, but not a whole lot of negative from there. Uh, I mean, we had 
I, I don't like Fox Day, and so we did a uh, episode um, going over his book about Jordan Peterson, which was just horrible. Um, and I, I, I found the book just massively insulting. I watched this um, episode of yours. Did you? Yeah. Yeah. That that kind of. Uh, I mean, we, Rachel, we, we kind of had our own little falling out over it, and yeah, I don't want to get into that stuff, but she was, you know, she liked the book, she was defending it, she's not a fan of Jordan Peterson, and so it got way off track, and it never really got to delve into the specifics, so there's a lot of very valid criticism that it did not stay on topic, because it didn't, um, but yeah, we, we got a decent amount of viewers for that video and definitely, you know, Vox Day and all his uh, followers all came in, you know, screaming and yelling. And I was like, all right, well, they can say whatever drivel they want. You know, I don't I didn't delete a single comment. They're still up there. People can read them. I just like I'm not going to sit there and engage with this. Um, and other than that, um, you know, there's the negatives. And you can also kind of see it as a positive is you, you meet certain figures that are certain pretty well-named figures that you make connections with in the uh, conservative or the free speech movement. And it's kind of like that, you know, don't don't meet your heroes mm-hmm. line. You know, you realize you think there's these great people and these virtuous people and they're doing this for good. And you realize they're just grifters mm-hmm. and there's a lot of that on the right and it really troubles me, but I don't like to do these, you know, videos where it's back and forth and they're doing videos against each other and calling each other out. And it's like, I'm not going to play that game. Other people can do that. Um, sure. You can argue there's a place for that. It's just, it's not my, my style. Um, it's not what I want to do. That's not the message I want to push out there, but that's the negative thing is, there is a lot of grifters out there um, that just it's 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 not an honest, heartfelt endeavor. Like, I'm not doing this for money. You know, I've, yeah. I've like, lost probably a couple thousand dollars doing this because I've put so much money into it just because I want to get the message out there and I want to create a, uh, a discussion. And like for you two, you're doing a fantastic job. Um, I've, you've gotten some amazing interviews, really enjoy watching them. The, the discussion that you're able to bring out in people is really unique. And when you watch a lot of other podcasts, you're like, Oh, I wish they would have talked about this. I'm more interested in this. And where you actually bring out those, those, uh, points in the discussion. And so you get some really unique and you, uh, interviews and you have fun with your show. You have a good show and you know, your following is you know, I've been watching your following and it's been uh, starting to really starting to kick off and you very well deserved. So well, thank you, Greg. You know what I think job. about that um, is that there are some people we said, like, don't meet your heroes. Right. So I used to work in entertainment and I learned that lesson way back then. You meet people whose work you admire and then you're kind of deflated once you realize you don't really like them as a person. (laughs) Um, And sometimes you continue working with them (laughs) for long after you should, um, (laughs) even though you don't like them as a person and then you learn hard lessons. But (laughs) um, I think, I think what it is is that when you're, if you don't have a solid footing of what your purpose is or or if you're not grounded in your purpose, you can let any other things become your primary purpose. So mm-hmm. with social justice people, that's their ideology. A lot of times is when, and as we've seen, as they they move into positions in companies at big, you know, big tech or in academia or in journalism, and they're everything at, at churches, everything's filtered through their ideology. That becomes their primary purpose. And, yeah. um, you know, f- fame, ego, money, those things can also become your primary purpose if you're not careful. And then once that's become the first purpose, whatever, even if you started with good intent, and once that gets first number one, then that's what you're filtering everything through. And it's going to cause you to make some bad choices. I think I think that there's a place even for people who, um, like I have, I have some opinions on some people who I think are 
are probably, um, you know, the fame and the glory and the money or whatever has maybe become their primary focus. But I think there's a purpose even for those people sometimes, because I think that kind of personality type um, is also probably really good at some things that, uh, that, that others are not, that maybe you need that narcissism in some ways to be, to be able to get a, a message out there. But, but I try and look at that, those people as a warning, because if you have, it's like that Bible verse about, the, the two guys who are praying beside each other and the Pharisees like, thank you, God, that I'm not like that wretched sinner over there, you know, and that I am so uh, pure, pure yeah. and, you know, I'm mangling it. But it's this prayer. where And then and then meanwhile, the guy he's talking about is like beating his his breast and like, you know, have mercy on me. I'm such a wretched sinner. He's acknowledging it. He's and so yeah. I think I think of um I think of those people like, like, well, I'll name one, like Chank Un- Unger, Unger, however you say his name. Chank Uger, Uger. Uger. Yeah. Yeah. U- Uger. I, I can't, I can never, yeah, it's the man of a million pronunciations of his yeah. last name. So I have yeah. no idea what Mr. He, Armenian Genocide, yeah. Right. I have no, I don't follow him. I haven't followed him long enough to have an opinion on what, what I think his original purpose was or not, but I definitely think his like that video of him being his worst self in the airport where he's berating the airline attendees and he thinks he looks good. He thinks he's the good guy and he's streaming the whole encounter and he looks like a self-righteous jerk. And so I look at something like that and I say, okay, don't look at that and think you're so much better. Carrie Smith. (laughs) Like that's, then you're the Pharisee. Like, thank God I'm not like that guy. And no, like you have to look at that and say, there before the grace of God goes me. Like I could totally become that dude. <laughs> oh yeah, I, any of us could be that. Yeah. And yeah. I just, I feel sorry for him because like, man, like he has no idea. Oh. And I think it's, just... it's, I mean, he's, a, in my opinion, I mean, he's a grifter, you know, he's, I've, he does these little, you know, we're working on a secret project. You know, and we're going to let you know as soon as we can, but keep on sending me money. You oh, know, really? like, yeah. yeah. And I'm like, oh, all right. Yeah. I've seen those games before. I know yeah. how that works. But I mean, that's personal responsibility. I mean, that's up to people. You know, they can only grift as long as people are willing to, uh, to buy into it. And that comes up to people need to be personally responsible. They need to embrace individualism more. They need to, be willing to be wrong. They need to have the self-confidence to be wrong so that they can go out there and question things. Ask, why Why do I believe this? All right, well, figure it out. Because eventually you're going to be put in a situation where you're going to have to defend your beliefs. And I would hope you'd be able to do that if somebody questions you on it. If you see like all these you know, interviews, these street interviews that they do all the time, and when they actually start addressing the ideology that these people are just shouting about and being so passionate out there willing to march and protest. And then when asked like, so what does that mean? They have no clue. Yeah. Right. Like, so why are you out there? Why are you, why are you, why would you be so passionate over something you admittedly, admittedly don't understand? Right. Yeah. I think, I mean, Carrie, I think you're right though, that there's a place, there's a place even for grifters because I, there is a large percentage of the population that doesn't want authenticity because they don't really want to go deep on anything and they don't really want to have real conversations. They just want to be thrown something to feel passionate about. And here's some, here's some self-righteousness you can have and speak these things or do this, or this is the side to be on. And like, here, here's how to join the club. And grifters are good often at, um, Grifters are often very good marketers. They're very good used car salesmen, right? They're very good at like fluff oh, yeah. without it's, substance. Yeah. And like, if as long as people, as long as there's a market for fluff without substance, like, I think they'll continue to exist. But some of those people maybe start out with a grifter and then realize, like, actually, I want something deeper. And maybe they end up, you know, going and engaging with someone who's not just a grifter. Yeah. yeah. Well, and I think that's that's a fair point, and. Uh, you will, you might see these people that were grifters and they, you know, came to the realization of what they were doing, but they, you know, a grifter can make a very strong point and just yeah. because they're grifter doesn't make the point any less valid. Right. And, yes. But, 
would try to constantly poison the well. Like, oh, well, they did this in the past and this. I'm like, yeah, but let's speak about what this one specific thing they said. Are they wrong? Right. Right. Yeah. So, right. yeah, I, I think that's, that's a, a fair point. Everybody has different uh, tools and talents and gifts. And sometimes I think whatever your weaknesses are might complement your strengths or, you know, and so for certain audiences, you know, there's also different kinds of audiences. And like you said, Carter, people are looking for different things. And some people just want red meat, I think, or that idea of yeah, that's being analogy. thrown. Yeah, yeah, they just want to be thrown the red meat of what they already know they like and want. And um, and it's still I, I still think there's a place for that. It's interesting. Can, anyway, can we I would just want to get back to something that you said earlier, Greg, because um, I, I want to just talk about if there's any nuance in what you're saying, um, you said no one's objective, which I agree with. No one, no one can actually achieve objectivity. Um, but isn't it incumbent upon someone who wants to have rational discussion to at least be striving for objectivity, admitting that they're probably not hitting it, but that objectivity is the, is the goal. I mean, isn't that part of rational discourse? Oh yeah, absolutely. But the the only, and I, I might not have said it well, but I, mean, I think we're basically on the same page. Um, and I, I just believe that the only way that you're going to be able to truly strive for objectivity and have these kind of discussions is the understanding that you really can't be. At the end of the day, you're never really going to be truly objective, but you should always want to be striving for it. The reason I'm asking yeah. is because I think one difference that you're seeing, with, and I think it's tricking a lot of people, a lot of normies are looking at the rise of the social justice um, ideology and, and the prevalence of it, and they're, they're confused. Like you were saying, we're going through logically what this means, and you like have an assumption that they have a logically consistent belief and that they believe in objective reality and that there's some standard to which they can be held and will ultimately be accountable to. Uh, but I don't think that's true for this movement. I, I don't, I don't think it's prime. I think it's primarily a psychological movement, not a philosophical one. And so they will just use any oh, yeah. grab bag from postmodernism or critical theory or whatever it is they, they need to use in order to justify their psychological need for in the moment, which might be to call you a Nazi or shout in a certain way or convince you of a certain thing or bully you or whatever it is. Yeah, and it, it is. And there's so much nuance to all of that. And it, it is, I think it is definitely mostly psychological. Um, and even the underlying psycho, uh, the underlying philosophy is still basically psychological in a lot of senses True. and it's it's just it's self-destructive there's no i mean that's it's like what's the end game so right. i'm sorry like my end game is is peace love and happiness you know like as long as your pursuit of happiness doesn't impact my pursuit of happiness you can do whatever the hell you want it's none of my business in my opinion even if like oh you know i i don't really like what they're doing but it's none of my business like my opinions really shouldn't mean a whole much whole lot to somebody because at the end of the day like i'm not i i should not have the power to have any impact right. on other people's lives other than maybe saying something inspirational or maybe more more than likely me doing something really stupid so people know what not to do in the future um I think that's one of the things that's not talked about a lot, though, with this is that the, for lack of a better term, I'm going to call you an individualist, like an enlightenment individualist style. I don't know where, exactly where you fit there, but you're somewhere clearly, you. clearly there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but that, that idea, that outlook on life, that perspective, that psychological perspective is based on something that you articulated earlier really well, which is a love for humanity, looking out at all the things that people can do and having this feeling of like, I want people to be free to do the things that they want to do, to be creative, to live the lives they want and to be happy in the way they want and do what they want. Like I want to, I want to unleash human potential and, and enable productivity. Uh, but I, I think, you know, I've been trying to look for unifying beliefs on, on the left 
for a while. And the only unifying, the only real unifying belief, I think, like principally, is nihilism. It's hatred of the good for being the good. It's like we don't want anyone to be happy or successful. That's that's basically the mindset. It's a very malevolent mm-hmm. universe premise or malevolent psychology. It seems to me. Yeah. No, I, I I think that there's a lot of truth to that. And I don't really know what the answer is. All I can do myself is always try to be kind. Always when I see somebody that is in need and I can help them, I try to help them. And so hopefully I can be some kind of example that these people, you know, if they're nihilists, I just, I can't imagine that they're not miserable people. Um, deep down like and they're you know dealing with a lot of depression or stress or what whatnot and hopefully that if they see me and other people being happy and joyful and wanting to help others that they might want that and start to be curious and get out of their funk here's the danger though see this this goes back to what you were talking about earlier about getting out of your anger and and that resonated with me because I had a lot of anger also, and a lot of it stemmed from childhood, but I funneled it through this ideology. And so it came out as anger towards anyone who wasn't a social justice ideologue. It came out as anger towards um, George Bush or any Republican, or, you know, it it just manifested itself in these other ways because you can funnel that, all that stuff childhood trauma or whatever, whatever it is you're holding, I think you can put it into these other things. And then it prevents you from even getting to the root of what you're really mad about and working on it. Because now you've said, oh, it's these, it's the patriarchy, it's the white supremacist culture, it's all this other stuff that I'm mad about, when really it's maybe something Oh, you gotta have self-responsibility. Yeah. If you don't have self-responsibility, you're, I mean, I think that's a big part of it is... You, yeah, you're they not don't. willing to say you screwed up. And that was a big thing I had a problem with. And I had to like make it almost a, become a habit uh, to where like when I would make a mistake, I would admit it and try to be ahead of it so that I, I'm always acknowledgeable about my faults mm-hmm. because I, I, it's so easy to point the finger at something else. Yes. And I, I just think like, the, like when you when you watch people play video games, they get really mm-hmm. mad, and they're like the stupid controller or the it was lag, you know. It was just like all this <laughs> stuff. Like when you're when you're watching it, you know, as not the one playing, you're just like, oh, it just sounds ridiculous, man. You just sound dumb, you know. Hey, hey, a lot of times in the arcade, my Miss Miss Pac Man machine really is the controller because they're very old machines. Sure, Carrie. Anyway, yeah. sure, Carrie. <laughs> As someone who has a history of getting angry at inanimate objects, though, I can totally relate. And um, for, for me, what had to happen was the realization. I had I had to have the realization that the inanimate object actually is an inanimate object. So who's my anger directed at? And then it was like a light bulb went off and it was like, oh, I'm angry at myself. Some work I'm needs to happen. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> I, I I still to this day I get really upset when I play video games <laughs> and uh, I I've broken a few controllers uh, so I usually I play by myself because I get upset <laughs> <laughs> you know what I found how I, I don't know do you do this with your kids but like I'm like pretty open with my daughter about some of my like psychological flaws, like, oh, you know, I'll, I'll get angry at inanimate objects if I'm frustrated or whatever. And I, I find it's actually quite helpful because she'll call me out on crap in the middle of something because <laughs> she's, because she just, like, kids don't really care. They don't have that. There's, like, less of a social barrier to, like, not pointing out that you're being a retarded yeah. person. So she'll just be like, yeah. you know, Dad, it's not the controller. So you're just mad at yourself. That's that thing you do. And it's like, oh, damn, yeah, you're right. Uh I don't know. It's, it's, yeah, it is, yeah, my daughter has done that. I mean, she's almost 11 now. Um and but I remember when I was doing my floors and I was I had these corner pieces I had to put in, but it was the 
you know, so around the door jams and the doors are at a 45 degree angle to, and then the next door over was at another angle from it. And so it was like this really wonky piece to put on. I was getting so frustrated. And, uh, so like I was trying to like tap it in. Then like, I think I jammed my thumb or something. I got pissed off and chucked the hammer across the room and, uh, I could hear my daughter downstairs, uh, going, uh, Dad's working on the floors, and it's not going so well. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, like, she would see me get upset. She's like, Dad, did you make a mistake? <laughs> <laughs> like, shut up, get out of here. You know, I, that... I mean, you think about it, you're like, you laugh at it, you know? It kind of, it kind of, uh, it takes you out of that moment. You're like, absolutely. oh, yeah. I'm... Yeah, absolutely. That, honestly, the, the time I've sworn the most recently was replacing like replacing a floor and subfloor and my daughter would like and my wife actually would be like count my swear they would be like T tell me how i'm doing they could measure based on how much i'm swearing and i would get like if i had a day of working on it and i didn't swear i would get like would sit at the dinner table and they would both be like you didn't swear that today that's a that's great <laughs> you didn't you didn't <laughs> swear at the floor <laughs> must, it must have been a good day exactly yeah that's 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 where my patience is like i like working uh you know working with my hands and everything but it's like when i'm doing like when i was doing the floor i get upset and then especially when i'm working on my car it's like i got an old sob and uh you get some old rusted bolts and stuff oh man i'm i'm out in the driveway making a fool of myself cursing up a storm yep and usually my neighbor tony's like ah must have must be having some success over there, you know. Just <laughs> make fun of me. Yeah, well, hey, so I want to I want to come back quickly to this idea though that you said about like once you get out of, like the answer is getting to get out of anger and patterns of, I would say, bad habits, like bad psychological habits, is is to have is to find joy, and I think it's to. Um, that, that, that probably sounds to anybody who's going through anger or depression or anxiety, that probably just sounds so flippant to say that because yeah, I know, what, happy, but it's true, but it's true. And I know that back then I would have heard something like that and rolled my eyes. Um, but there's something dangerous about this social justice ideology that it encourages people to stay in the anger, um, and to stay in whatever trauma they've had to stay in what Eckhart Tolle calls the pain body. And it also, it incentivizes victimhood. It incentivizes um, mental health problems because then you get to wear that as a badge of your marginalization. And in this ideology, marginalization is a form of social currency. So you get, you get elevated, you get more of a voice, you have more power in the ideology, the more marginalized you are. So I'm thinking of like what you were saying is, you know, hope, hopefully by your behavior and showing people that you can be happy and joyful and all these things. If you let go of some of that stuff, if you resolve some of that stuff that maybe people just see through your actions and not through anything you're saying that there's this better choice. And, and I certainly have tried to keep that in mind since I've left behind that belief system is that um, they don't, they, a lot of the people in it, they're so miserable they get yeah. personally offended by expressions of joy or yeah. love or um, frivolity. Carter and I talk a lot about intermittent <laughs> frivolity. They don't like it. Um, they will come for you and say things. If you're in the cult and you unknowingly express joy um, and you don't somehow center it, they always talk about centering. If you don't center your joy in whatever like racial justice or feminism work you're doing, then they'll come for you. It's sort of this, um, oh, it's your privilege that allows you to have an, a nice day at the beach. And why don't you think about, you know, it's just, just it's sort of like yeah. you have to always be uh, what they call doing the work, which really just means being miserable and being yeah. an evangel e evangelist and constantly shoving this ideology down people's throats. I saw last night, I saw um, this former friend of mine who um, is – has become a rabid social justice warrior. She used to kind of dabble in it back when I was a rabid one. She wasn't, but now she's like, that's all she posts about. And she's, um, she's white. So she's one of like the 
the stereotype. She's very vocal about it. She has to show that she's a good ally. She wears yeah. all the white silence is violent stuff and everything. And I saw her do a post last night. I was reading some of her posts and I saw one was um, she works somewhat in the music industry, in the entertainment industry. She was saying she was basically scolding musicians. She was like, I see all of you who post who post the blackout Tuesday square or who post the rainbow flag square on certain days. And then, then what happens to the rest of your feed? It just becomes pictures of you and your band and what you're doing on the road. And like, why aren't you doing the work? You know, and it's this real yeah. miserable, like, how dare you live life? How dare yeah, you? If you're doing life? like one nice thing and you're like, Oh, so you don't care about X, Y, and Z. I'm like, you know, I can, have a good time and still care about something. Yes. You know? <laughs> well, it was like, yeah, it's... Didn't, didn't they do that with Taylor Swift? When she donated like a quarter million dollars to something and they, they piled on her for not showing up at the women's march and wearing a pussy hat because that's the work, not just donating money, uh, <laughs> which is yeah. pretty hilarious to me. Well, I think it's, it's all these people are virtue signaling and they don't actually do anything. And, so they need other people in high positions to do the virtue signaling as well. So it makes them feel good. Like it makes them feel like they're part of something that they're actually accomplishing something or doing, doing real work when I'm like, you're sitting behind a keyboard getting upset. Yeah. You know, I mean, and you know, you bring about, you know, joy and you know, people, you know, good, thing that people can do is start like listing off the things that make them happy and listing off the things that make them upset and a lot of that's going to be you know coming to the realization that a lot of what you are doing yourself is what is causing you to be unhappy and you can start to replace those things one at a time and it takes time it's not something that's like oh i figured it out well <laughs> starting this day forward Hundred percent happy, everything's gravy. No, that's that's not how it works. It is. It took years and years for me, and I'm still working on it. I still have issues. You have to. Um, it's a continual thing. But they're not fine. What they're doing is their problems that are making them depressed. They're replacing that as saying that's what gives them joy. And so you run into these, you know, the people that aren't happy unless there's something to be unhappy about. Like they yes. just they thrive on it. So they're they're it's it's completely joyless and they've flipped it and so the things that would give them joy, they're now associating to those are what make me unhappy. And it's I don't other than, you know, trying to be a just a good person and stuff. I don't know necessarily and I think it's unique to each person of how you get them out of that. Because I don't think they were ever, like, it's, maybe it's reminding them, like, hey, remember that time, like, when you didn't subscribe to all this stuff and we were so happy, you know, we used to go hang out and do this. Like, what happened? Yeah. Do they want to be happy, been... though? Because you, you can have a, a total mindset. I've been in a funk before in my life where, like, someone could have come up to me and if they had just said, you, you kind of want to be depressed right now, don't you? I would have to, like, honestly be like, yeah, I'm totally... I'm totally like while I'm listening to the cure and like the old cure or whatever, like disintegration. And I'm like wallowing in bed and I don't want to get up and like, I'm enjoying my funk. I'm not, it's not, I wouldn't call it joy actually, but like there's yeah. something like I'm addicted to my funk and like, and I don't want, I don't want to get out of my funk. Um, and I, I don't, I, I don't know how you, I don't either. I don't know how you pull someone out of that. I know exactly what you're talking about. I've been there many times and you just like, I actively do not want to be happy right now. Right. I don't want to feel better. Stop and, trying to make me feel better. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, <laughs> but why? <laughs> really? Yeah. And I still do this. I still like, there are times where like, I just want to be miserable today. But I'm like, right. but why would you want to be miserable? That's just, <laughs> you know. My guess is there's, yeah. there's self-hatred or something involved in some of that is, is my only guess, but I I don't know. I, I, you know, something that this is reminding me of something else that uh, is related. So did you notice that you mentioned they're always doing the work, right? Did yeah. you notice that almost always, if not always, 
the work never actually involves doing anything positive. It doesn't involve like, let's go to Habitat for Humanity and build homes, or let's start a soup kitchen, or let's oh, yeah. teach entrepreneurs. No, it's, yeah. it's always, let's tear some people down or chide people or wag our fingers. Like, that's the work. The work is always destruction. The work is never productive work. Oh, yeah, 100%. Yeah, that's what that's what really bothers me. It's like, all right, so if you you really cared and you want to do the work, like we, we can disagree ideologically or politically, but I can respect you if you're actually going out there. I'm like, okay, well, I'm going to go to a food bank or something and help feed people, or I'm going to go to a Habitat for Humanity and help build houses, or you know, I know there's uh, this lady that she's living by herself and she can't. She doesn't. She can't physically maintain her home, so I'm going to go and help her do some things around the house, and so her house doesn't fall apart around her, and you know things are safe and stuff. They're not doing any of that stuff, right? Yeah. And they almost seem opposed to it. Yes, and I then think when they are. Does that? They're like, oh, you're just making up for some guilt you have, you know, your white guilt or something. They're like, no, I'm doing it because it's the right thing to do. Like it's that simple, right? And I think I think they resent it when they, I think they resent it because it highlights what they're not doing. You're totally it's, right. It's much like we talked about. Um, Carter and I had this discussion recently about uh, people who say, you know, you or, or this, you know, you not drinking makes me feel judged about my drinking, and it's like, no, you just feel bad about your drinking. It has nothing to do with the, what this person's doing. But I think it's like seeing someone else doing this thing that maybe you want or you you resent them for it, whether it's resenting them for um, a good habit or 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 like you said, doing adding something positive to the world or a talent of theirs or some type of success of theirs. But you're resenting it because you want it and you're not taking ownership over fixing the things in your life that you that you need to fix or making the sacrifices that you need to make to in order to get it. You just resent them. It's easier yeah. to do that. Like you can learn from that. Like the yeah. great thing about people being more successful than you or being better than you at things that you want to be good at, most of those people, if you approach them and ask them, like, so what? What is your key to success? Like, what? What did you to get do to get so good at that? A lot of people are, are nice and willing to let you in on some of their secrets, mm. uh, and like. I had that problem, like be super jealous and envious of people and, you know, why are they successful? I should be there. I'm like, well, I'm not there because I'm being stupid and uh, not not doing not putting the work in. Yeah. Um, now when I see it, I try to make an active effort and now it's, it's just kind of second nature. It's like when I see somebody succeed, I'm happy for them, legitimately happy and want to congratulate them and if it's something that i want to be better at it's like man like you're really good at this what what do you do like do, do you have a practice routine or you know there's something that you listen to or heard that, that really uh, inspired you like what what is what is it you know what's your secret and 99 percent of the time they'll tell me and they're they're actually very engaged and eager to want to share that with people because they're proud of themselves yeah. yeah but yeah too many people are just caught up in in jealousy and think they need it's that entitlement you know it's they, they, yeah they go they're owed something like nobody owes you anything and you can go do everything by the book all the right things in life and shit still won't work out for you you you've got to endure and get over it and yeah. eventually things work out but if you're going to get caught up in negativity, then things are not are not going to work out well for you. You have to fail up. And this goes back to what we were saying before about, about um, you know, the time that you put into your show or the time that we put into our show. It's like it has to be something that the purpose can't be, like you said, money or fame because you're, that's, you're not going to – that's not a strong enough or deep enough purpose. And it has to be something you're willing to do – anyway forever without ever attaining those things because you enjoy it because the purpose is something else because the purpose is um you know uh encouraging free speech encouraging dialogue 
uh, because there's something deeper and more grounded. And I saw this as an entertainment manager where, like, I would have, I had a, a client who once was like, it was, he was always jumping between, like, tactics for fame. And it it wasn't as it wasn't like do whatever the 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 medium was was not his passion. It was just you know Mark Maron has a really successful podcast, so I need to start doing a podcast so I can be famous and make lots of money. And it's like no, like you need to do a podcast because that's really you feel compelled to do it, and you have there's something you want to say so that you keep yeah. doing it every day, even without fame and money, even if you don't get fame and money. You can't have the fame and money can't be the driving thing. That's that's ridiculous. But um, I think people get. I think people get, um, I don't know, sometimes it's just, it's, it's what we talked about before. They just have priorities in the wrong place. So yeah. there was another thing I wanted to bring up, and I, well, I think I, I've lost my train of thought. While you're thinking, so. Carrie, I'm gonna, yeah. I'll, I'll yeah. bring up the, I want to go back to this idea of resentment, I think, which is what you were just talking about, which is like looking at someone who's who's succeeding better than you are in some area of, of your life and having your gut reaction be, not not one of admiration and support but one of uh resentment and jealousy and i honestly i think that's probably one of the best litmus tests for uh like if i was gonna if i was gonna have like an island of people like that would be one of the litmus tests i think like well how do you feel about people who are more successful than you because um it, if you look at the left Look, there, I've got problems with people like Bill Gates and Jeff Bezos and, and Mark Zuckerberg. Absolutely, I have problems with their behavior. But it's the people who, like, they don't have to know anything about them. They hate them by virtue of the fact that they're successful. Like, they don't... Yeah. You just say the name. Oh, I. Oh, he's an asshole. I hate him. Because... Because why? Because he has billions of dollars and you don't. It's a... It's a... Um, it's a very small mindset. It's a... It's not a growth mindset. And... It's the opposite, like you're saying, it's the opposite of actually how you get successful. And it just, that resentment eats you up inside. Um, and if you, if you oh, like, yeah. even people like Tony Robbins, remember Tony Robbins? I don't know if he's still around. I, think, I guess he might. Yeah. yeah. Even Tony Robbins would talk about this. I remember him years ago talking about like, uh, when he wanted to get married, he, he saw an older guy that, whose wife he had totally had a crush on and thought was awesome, but she was like, you know, a decade or two older and, and obviously married. So instead of getting all like pissed or resentment, like resentful about it or feeling like, you know, how come I can't find a girl? He just went and asked the guy. He's like, your wife is awesome. How did you do that? I want to find a wife like that. And the guy was like, sure. And like talks to him about like what kind of person he <laughs> yeah. had to be to attract a woman like that. And like, and, and I think he did that, did that with everything in business and personal life. And uh, there's something horribly sad and dysfunctional about a society that looks at differences and is angry about people who are better at something or are more lucky at something or have achieved something that you haven't. I don't see how that yep. society sustains at all. Yeah. 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 It's about tearing people down. It's like, I don't, I really don't want to be part of that. Right. I don't want to use I, a light remember... because Edison invented it and I didn't. <laughs> right. <Okay>. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I remember one of the uh, one of the things I wanted to say was that uh, speaking of asking people who have something that you would like for advice, I remember bookmarking this Patton Oswalt blog. This was years and years ago. I bet it's not even up anymore. But he, I think this is in the days of MySpace. Even I think it was a MySpace post. <laughs> he did a post where he's wow. like, I get so many messages from fans who want to know how to get into comedy or how to get good at, com at stand-up comedy. So I'm just going to write this blog and pin it here because it's the same answer. And he was like, you just have to go to a crap load of open mics and put in the work. There's no secret. He was like, you just have to do it. You have to do it and do it again and do it again and just keep doing it until you get good at it. There's no, you know, and, and somebody like that, they might have um, some other type of advice. Like they might be able to share with you something that changed for them or changed their perspective or, ch or gave them inspiration or helped them get past some psychological block or whatever. But in terms of the actions necessary, it, it kind of opened my mind when I saw that because I used to represent comedians who would get similar emails a lot. And it was, and he was like, just go do the open mics. That's yeah. you just oh, you yeah. put the if, work if in. If you go out and you look at all of these comedians that are highly successful now, every, almost every single one of them 
put in the work for years and years and years of failing miserably, embarrassing themselves and refusing to give up, learning from their mistakes, going out there again and again and again until they made it. And, but people just, they see somebody successful and their instant assumption is they didn't earn that. They don't deserve that. Mm -hmm. Right. I'm like, why, why do you say that? Like, what, where is that coming from? And when you try to delve into that with them, say, okay, well, wh what is it about them? Like, why do you say that <clears throat> about that person? Do you know about them? And they're like, well, no. I'm like, so they could have earned it. And they're like, oh, yeah, I doubt it. Then they're like, well, actually, I do know something about that person, so let me uh, let me explain you something. And I lay down, like, their life story and bullet points, and all of a sudden say, well, I mean, that's just an exception. That's not the rule. You know, I'm like, okay, yeah, just just uh, try to uh, shift the goalpost and point somewhere else. And then you fall into whataboutisms instead of just like, you know what, I was wrong. I shouldn't have thought that way. Thanks for the correction. You know, yeah. and move on. Have, have you heard of, Greg, have you heard of, I go down these rabbit holes sometimes because I get, I'm really interested in the way that, the mind works and like I like true crime I'm, I like I don't know I, I like trying to figure out how human beings can do awful things and I'm really interested in personality the same way. disorders yeah. yeah and all that stuff so um, I'm sure then you've probably heard of the term covert narcissism I've heard of that I haven't really like well this reminds me of that I was just watching a video about it and it was it was basically the psychologist was saying that Covert narcissism is not the narcissism you're used to seeing where someone's always boasting that it usually gets mistaken at first for someone who's not a narcissist because a lot of times they talk, you almost view them as someone who's had a lot of bad luck or bad things always happen to them because the way they talk or someone who's depressed, you view them as someone who's depressed because a lot of times they're always talking about this didn't work out for me and this awful thing happened and this but once you dig a little deeper, it's not depression. It's it's a, a type of narcissism that's basically like, I am so awesome if only the world knew and gave me what I'm entitled to. They're angry right? at the universe. Oh, yeah. <laughs> They're angry at the universe. And it's not a depression so much as it is like this deep anger at not at their at their ego not being re sufficiently recognized as being extraordinary. Oh yeah, no, ab absolutely. Yeah, I was kind of like that. I, you know, I used to really be into like theater and like love acting and all that. And so I remember in the back of my head, always like, oh, by the time I'm 25, I'm going to be rich and famous. I'm going to be a famous actor, and you know, I'm such a good singer and all this stuff. Uh, none of that's true. I'm not <laughs> a good actor. I am not a good singer. I, am, I, I don't have the body type nor the attractive features uh, to really make it in that industry. and But like I was just like, oh, the world just hasn't been able to recognize how amazing I am. <laughs> and it took a good friend that just basically you know laid it out. I was like, look, dude, you, you think you're good at this? You're not. And it pissed me off. But, and it took me like a couple of weeks, you know, but I really like, I took it to heart and I'm like, God damn it. He's right. That sucks, man. But I was like, <laughs> it, you know, some of us are never going to be like the next Tiger Woods or something. You know, this whole idea of like equality or whatever. I'm like, you never really get that other than, you know, treating people equally. You know, it's like, I'm never going to be the golfer that like Tiger Woods is or Mickelson, you know, it's, I can golf my entire life. I'm, I'm, it just, it's not in the cards for me. It's just not going to be there. You know, I'm not going to be the chiseled jaw, you know, perfect, uh, white, pearly white smile, you know, perfect physical features actor out there. It's not in the cards for me. 
I dig your beard, by the way. I prefer it to the chiseled jaw. But now I want to see you do one of your Photoshop mock-ups of yourself as the chiseled jaw, pearly white smile. (laughs) I can do that. Do it. (laughs) Um, So tell me, I want to switch gears and talk a little bit about your father's book, The Road Home. Yeah, um, so it's... Kind of my life story in a lot of ways. It's mostly, it's about my mother um, when she was 31 years old. She got uh, diagnosed with breast cancer and it's been like one cancer after the other for like 27 years of her life. So most of my whole childhood and adult life until she passed away about five years ago um, was her dealing with that. And it's an incredible story, uh, that my, you know, my dad wrote the book, my mom, uh, while she was still alive, we're working on the book to tell the story. And it's kind of about our family's journey, her journey through it, uh, interacting with the doctors and how, you know, she'd been told a million times, you know, by doctors literally told her, I wouldn't touch you with a 10 foot pole. And then another doctor would come along and have to go against what I like to call the Coliseum of ego in the medical industry, where you get these doctors that that uh, don't want to take risky cases; they just want to pump up their resume. And so, luckily, there would be doctors that said, "No, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I, I can do this. I'm gonna work on you." And you know, and then she would, you know, live for you know, decade plus longer after these doctors were like, "No, get your affairs in order." And my mom wouldn't take that for an answer. Um, it eventually just got to the point, like she had been, she'd had so much surgery, had so many procedures done, had been through chemo a million times. Her body just literally couldn't take it anymore. Mm-hmm. And so she was just like, I'm not doing chemo anymore. She all like her big thing was she wanted to be able to live long enough to see her children's children. And she was able to do that and have uh, many years with my daughter before passing away. And uh, so, I mean, I'm agnostic, but I lean Christian. And, you know, I'm just thankful to God for the time I got to spend and the lessons I got to learn from my mom. Um, but it's it's really, I actually haven't read it. It's, it's, too, it's too raw and personal for me. You know, to to read that, like I've tried a couple of times, it just it, it was too hard for me to read. Um, but yeah, you can go out. You have to. There's a number of books called The Road Home. Uh, so and you can buy it on Amazon. Um, and if they run out of copies on Amazon, you know, you can always message me. And like, What's your copy. dad's name? Chuck Wilson. So Chuck if you Wilson. if you type in like on Amazon a Road Home Chuck Wilson, uh, it'll you'll pop, it'll pop up. Uh, but it's it's basically about my mom's life and, uh, you know, all the different stories, uh, you know, from, you know, basically her from 31 and 27 years of uh, battling cancer. What did you get from your parents that you think, what are you grateful for? Or, and what did you get from them that made you who you are today that kind of inoculated you against bad ideology um that's a good question well my mom you know has been a fighter like she's the toughest woman i've ever known and so like she just would not take no for an answer like she always fought and battled until literally she couldn't battle anymore her body just couldn't take it but well i call it a battle but it's really a war i mean like you know, it's kind of like if anybody ever demoralized cancer, my mom did it. <laughs> you know, it's like <laughs> she just wouldn't give up. So I, you know, I learned a lot of perseverance from my mother and from my father. You know, he's he's a you know, retired naval officer, so he's a he's a very principled, stern, tough guy. But he's also very compassionate, and loving, and he was. He absolutely loved my mom, and he was with her 
every step of the way and enduring everything with her. And that was the connection that they had was something super special. And it was one of those things like I wasn't going to get married until I found somebody that uh, was like my mom. That was strong character and caring and loving like my mother because I wanted to be able to have that kind of marriage. And, you know, I lucked out, you know, I met my wife and, uh, she puts up with me, which is a uh, saintly thing to do. Uh, but I mean, it changed my life big time. You know, now I got a daughter things are going great. I'm super happy. And I've got this amazing wife that I wouldn't have had if it hadn't been from the inspiration from my parents and that, and like my father was an entrepreneur. So I learned entrepreneurship and independence, um, learned how to fail and get back up. And because my father just like, he wouldn't accept that, you know, he wouldn't, you know, if you fail, you, you get back up and you try again. And, uh, you know, we're always supportive and, uh, in his, his, uh, Naval officer kind of way, which, you know, a little bit of tough love and you kind of need that. It's my, I always loved it. And people kind of think it's weird, but like if I screwed up, like say I got in trouble with the law, my dad would have been the first person to call the police on me because wow. that's unacceptable behavior and you need to learn a lesson. And I was, I love my dad to death. I have a great relationship with my dad. Um, and, but you know, there's a line you don't cross like there. And so I learned, you know, I got my principles and my morals from him. You know, I grew up in church and everything. So going to church and, you know, having a, uh, a foundation and in, in Christian morals and everything. But I think that answers your question. Yeah. Without I, you it's very inspiring. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Thank you for sharing it. But. Yeah, a lot of life experiences. And my dad was an entrepreneur, so owned lots of businesses. I owned some businesses. You know, we owned part of a brewery. So, you know, I learned how to brew beer. I learned how to build things and ran subways. He owned subways. And, you know, he helped me uh, finance me when I, I bred and ra- uh, raised seahorses for a while. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and, uh, uh, I failed in that. Oh. <laughs> Why? Wow. It, it It's really tough, and the industry is cutthroat. Really? Yeah. <laughs> so. I see a documentary about the seahorse. I, I had, <laughs> it's fun. I love horses. They're some of my favorite animals. Uh, <laughs> I always like to tell people that because it's so weird. It is They're like, weird. what? <laughs> Just a little bit. <laughs> there needs to be a documentary about it, like the spelling bee ones, where you, you really peer into the wor- this whole world. I love those kind of documentaries where you're like, I have no idea what this community is like, and then they take you right into it. I just watched a short one on... Uh, all, uh, these kids and young adults who compete with, in uh, cube competitions, Rubik's Cube competitions. And... That, Amazing. That's a new one, isn't it? Because I, I want to say I've seen the thumbnail for that. Yeah, it was great. But seahorse breeding. <laughs> There's got to be a Tiger King version of the seahorse breeding community. That the seahorse totally King, right? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> that bitch, Carol Baskin strikes <laughs> exactly. again. There's got to be a bitch of the seahorse breeding community. <laughs> that's okay. right. One final Photoshop request from me. I want to see that poster. I want to see the Tiger King, but I want to see you on it. I need to have a You're mermaid. It with a saddle? With yeah. A tri- to have, oh, riding it. Yeah, even better than a merman. Yes. You need to be on the seahorse. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I find the idea yeah. of that image quite disturbing for some reason. but uh. I don't know why you would. Me and my gristled features... <laughs> Tested riding a, uh, a seahorse sea horse. with a trident. <laughs> Who knows? I, I, I'm insulted why you find that disturbing, sir. Well, maybe you should uh, maybe you should call me a Nazi and try and get me fired from... Uh, That's right. Right. <laughs> you are literally Hitler right now. <laughs> I... Get in line, buddy. 
<laughs> Hit me up, Carrie. What else you got for me? Well, I just wanted, uh, we're going to have to go soon. We're, uh, I, I just wanted you to tell people again where they can find you online. And we, we'll plug it. We'll put all these links in the description as well. But where can people visit your show? So it's Three Craters Symposium. Uh, that's Craters with a K. Uh, just Three Craters. And you can check us out. Three Craters on Facebook. We're kind of on Twitter. I mean, we have a Twitter page. I really hate Twitter, so I'm rarely on there unless I want to poke the bear sometimes. Um, and then we have our YouTube channel. And I think we have a Twitch and DLive. Um, but I I just broadcast to them. I don't ever really pay attention to them. Um, but mostly, you know, Facebook and Twitter, uh, Facebook and YouTube. Facebook is where you guys stream a lot of your videos, right? And we stream to everything live, and it's all you know broadcast at once. And just to plug, I tech. I, I'm not on the show because it's completely apolitical. Um, but there's a show called Blue Collar Green Pockets that I help tech for. And it's just about highlighting the blue collar industry, the different jobs, um, jobs that you can do without having to get a college degree, and to show people that you can be very successful in life and you don't have to have a college degree. I mean, that's great if you want to, but you yeah. know, and so you every week is a, is without a, a college week. degree. I'm pretty sure. Yeah, I think you can. <laughs> <laughs> that's a great show. That's something we talked about every week and we get professionals in the industry that come out and they talk about it and, you know, try to try to push that onto, you know, kids that are undecided. I love so, it because I don't yeah. want any more humanities majors in the world, and I don't think parents should be uh, mortgaging their houses to have kids indoctrinated in social justice ideology. So I think it's great, and there's probably a big—I would imagine there's a market for um, skilled labor in a way that—I uh, I imagine that market's growing, plumbers, electricians, all that kind of stuff. Oh, yeah. I mean, there is there is absolutely no shortage of jobs in the blue-collar industry. I mean— all the people I've talked to, the owners of various companies, uh, two of the hosts have their own HVAC companies. And uh, my father is on there actually as one of the hosts. And they are all looking for, like, they're hungry for employees. Like, they are actively and always looking for employees. And they pay really, really well. Wow. And, uh, yeah. No shortage of blue collar jobs whatsoever. The downside is they that pay, you don't have to learn about Marxism. Your education. Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> I was going to say that they, they pay for your, I mean, you can get educated for free. I mean, they pay for it. Really? Yeah. You know, the, the vast majority of these places will pay to send you to school so you can learn your craft. You don't get stuck with massive student loans or any of that stuff. Um, but there, I mean, there is a special place for underwater gender fluid uh, basket weaving. <laughs> it's a very that special we place. Do, yeah, it's a niche, but it's important. <laughs> that's awesome. So that's called Blue Collar Green Pockets. Um, yeah. That's, I think, going to be a real interest to YouTube. some of our viewers. Where'd you say? They're on Facebook and YouTube, so you can just search for them there. Cool. Um, we had him on the podcast one time to kind of introduce it and everything, but it's completely apolitical. It's it's just, you know, we're here to sh highlight the industries and it's, you know, people that have been very successful in their lives trying to pass off some of their knowledge and, you know, help future generations of, uh, you know, kids and adults that want to change career fields. So awesome. I thought I'd give that a plug as well. But hey, I really appreciate you having me on this show. I, I th think you you two are doing a fantastic job. And I really look forward to what the future holds for you two. Because I think you're really on the right track. You're honest. Like you, you have an honest, true, principled pursuit of what you're doing. And it, it, it's clearly evident in your show. And I, I, I really enjoy watching watching uh your show and i enjoy your interactions with uh your audience and your friends and 
So. Well, thank you, Greg. And I'm, I'm so grateful that you gave us your time today while you're getting ready for the wedding. Um, well, hopefully we can do more of this. Cause I like, I like the casual feel of conversations we have and Absolutely. yeah, it's good having a friend on. So, and we're going to have to have a uh, Carter on so we can uh, do like an hour and a half of just talking crap about tiger. I think that would be awesome. <laughs> I've got a long yeah. list of grievances. So, uh, if, it, if you can pitch it to two hours, I think we're good. Carter, Carter was like, ten, just things to, about tiger. <laughs> 10 things I hate about Tiger. Yes, that's, he, he, Carter was like, we just have to get to a point where we're successful enough where you don't have to dog sit anymore because we have so many interactions from the dog. Because it's not just Tiger. Usually, usually there's a lot of other dogs here, but the pandemic kind of slowed that down. Anyway, <laughs> and they bark, you know, they get all loud. They get like to interfere with the with the show. Sure. OK, well, one last time. Um, thank you for coming on, Greg. Hey, man, thanks for having me. I appreciate yeah. it. I had fun. Thank you, Greg. Thanks for watching. If you're new to the channel, we have a deep content library that includes interviews with everyone from Mike Cernovich to Megan Murphy, so go check it out. If you'd like to see more, please consider supporting the show by visiting unsafespace.com slash donate. You can find us on all the major social media platforms, at least for now, and you can find a community of like-minded individuals on our Unsafe Space chat on Telegram. See you there. Warning. This is an unsafe space. Dangerous ideas have been detected. The content of this production has not been authorized by the Cathedral. Pay no attention to it. For your protection, the following co-conspirators have been unpersoned and marked for cancellation. Please avoid any contact with these individuals. I have calculated a 98.5% chance that these individuals are on the wrong side of history. If you think about it, no one should be allowed to express opinions. But don't. Think about it, I mean. That's not your job. Thinking has been scientifically proven to be less efficient than compliance. Why choose between liberty and security when you can give up both? Computer voice, Curtis, never mind, that last line is fake news. Please disregard it and return to your safe space immediately. There will be cake.